thank you all for coming and I hope you have an enjoyable evening. So, with no further ado, I would like to introduce Julian to talk about the Hausman family. Um, as many of you know, um, most of you are sat here this evening because of Julian's father who created the society 50 years ago with John Pugh. And evidently, you weren't that enamored at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but he is now. So, um, so can you please give Julian a very warm welcome. So, more or less 50 years ago today, uh, this scene you see on the screen was taking place. Uh, this is in, I think, John Pugh's kitchen and he and my father are boring Sally Pugh with the project. And John Pugh was the first to um, write a series of articles about the Hausmans in the Bromsgrove Messenger. My father read these and sent in corrections, as he always did in these circumstances, but the two of them became friends. And they jointly founded the Hausman Society with my father as secretary and John Pugh as chairman. And at the time, uh, I was uh, a young librarian in Birmingham, more interested in young women than in poetry. And I thought, this won't last. And here we are, 50 years later, and the Hausman Society is still thriving. Its journal is still uh, read and purchased by uh, universities all around the world and I'm honoured to be part of the society and to be giving this lecture tonight, a joint lecture of the Hausman Society and the Bromsgrove Society. So, the man himself, I know he's not in position this week, uh, some uh, young lads tried to climb up the statue the other day and dislodged him, so he's gone away for repairs. But he will be back soon, and this scene will be reenacted. What you can see here is John Pugh and the Duke of Wellington, um, uh, or Duke of Westminster, I should say, um, uh, welcoming everybody to the unveiling of the statue of A. E. Hausman. Now, the knowledge of the Hausmans in 1973, when the society was founded, was somewhat limited. It was based on the um, research of uh, A. Hausman's sister, Kate, and she did her best, but in fact, in the 1930s, when she was working, record offices hadn't really got off the ground, and uh, they were relying very much on family traditions and indeed they handed those on to John Pugh and my father and they introduced into uh, their book Bromsgrove and the Hausmans all sorts of misconceptions that the Hausman family themselves had and I've spent ooh, the last 10 years trying to dispel some of these illusions but when once they're in print it's very difficult. And one of the main problems was their lack of understanding of a key figure in the Hausman history, and that is John Adams. Those of you with excellent eyesight might see um, on the map there, which comes from an uh, 1852 sale catalog, uh, the, uh, the cotton mill, and it says John Adams immediately above it. You can presumably see the enormous uh, mill pond, uh, seven acres of water to power this mill. And John Adams is the reason that the Hausman came to Bromsgrove. But he came 30 years earlier than the Hausman family thought. So it's amazing how um, families can ignore um, uh, pieces of history. I presume the Hausmans didn't emphasize John Adams because he was in trade. And he came here as a young man setting up a, 
a hosiery spinning outfit in a former cotton mill, which itself had been, here's an image of it from 1868, this had been set up in the uh, 1780s as a cotton mill uh, by a firm from Preston who were facing um, industrial unrest, trying to introduce the water frame to the spinning of cotton. And within 10 years of building this mill, they went back to Lancashire because the uh, idea of spinning uh, cotton by machinery was well established then, and they didn't need to work in Bromsgrove so far away from their source. The same applied to the hosiers in Leicester. And they sent the young John Adams to Bromsgrove to uh, adapt all the machinery in the cotton mill to spin worsted yarn for the hosiery industry. So all the product went back to Leicester. So there must have been constant toing and froing uh, there and back. Now, the young John Adams wasn't satisfied with the cotton mill. He also bought a former corn mill and needle pointing mill, Charford Mill. Charford's in the news tonight, isn't it? So Charford Mill was added to the Adams Empire in 1800. So there was enormous capacity here for spinning worsted. Now, John Adams himself uh, uh, did get married, and he married uh, Dorothy Fisher in eight, 1792, and unfortunately, she died bearing his first child. So John Adams was childless. He didn't marry again for many, many years, and it turns out that he rather adopted his sister's children. Now, We'll come back to the sister's children in a minute, which is where the Hausmans come in. But uh, in order to understand John Adams' position in Bromsgrove, uh, John Pugh and my father thought that because he called himself Captain John Adams, that he was a retired sea captain. And far from it, he was a captain in the local militia, more or less self-appointed. He would set up the militia and he would be the captain of it. So this is a letter he wrote presumptuously to the Lord Lieutenant of Worcestershire saying how he was getting on setting up the local regiment. So it gives me much pleasure to hear that your Lordship approves my exertions. Do you know, I should put my reading glasses on. That's better. Right. The Corps met for drill on Sunday next, and from that day they will continue to exercise till fit for service, every Sunday from 8 to 11 o'clock, when they will attend divine service, and on each Monday from 2 to 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. We have fixed upon a very cheap and neat uniform for the volunteers of this part of the county, and the whole to be of one kind, viz. felt cap with leather poke rosette and feather, black stock, scarlet jacket, gilt buttons, and yellow collar and cuffs, white linen covers for the breeches, and black leggings. The whole cost of each dress will only be one pound 16 shillings. Now, I don't think you impressed the Lord Lieutenant by saying you've got a cheap uniform, but nonetheless, he thought it worth pointing out as a hosier uh, that he knew how to economize on these important matters. So in becoming the leader of the local militia, he was moving up in local society. He was already probably the biggest employer in Bromsgrove, and now he was trying to move into the top circles of the county. And we're not quite sure where he lived when he came to Bromsgrove in 1790. It's not till 19 years later that he moved to Perry Hall. Now, Perry Hall had been the home of a leading linen manufacturer, but this particular building was alongside the ancient Perry Hall. 
And do you remember it looking like this when the ivy was all over it? Well, a lot of people thought this was the remains of the ancient Perry Hall. But in fact, uh, we know from later references in sale catalogues that this was a garden feature. This was a vinery set up by the Hausmans much later. We don't know where they got all the masonry from, but this is not definitely not the ancient Perry Hall. And in fact, this was the Perry Hall that Adams moved into in 1819, which had been the home farm to the ancient Perry Hall. And this is the detail from the conveyance in 1819 of Perry Hall to John Adams. And we can show you a detail of the actual building. And can you see on the left it says house and then cottages. And so that house exactly matches the present day Perry Hall, now called Houseman Hall. And clearly um, John Adams bought an existing building. Can you see he also bought the uh, gardens on the other side of Kidderminster Road going up to the churchyard. So it was quite a big purchase, but then John Adams by this time was uh, the leading citizen of Bromsgrove. He could afford to splash out. However, by 1824, the cotton mill, or the worsted mill as he would have called it, was redundant. They'd established the principle, even in Leicester, that spinning by water frames was a good idea, and the labor force there, which had been so anti in the 1790s, were now accepting of the wisdom of spinning in the uh, best possible way. So they decided to sell off the worsted mill. And here we have the advert from 1824 a very valuable freehold worsted mill, four stories high with wings of three stories in which are extensive, an extensive business in the manufacture of worsted yarn has been carried on for upwards of 30 years, together with the shops, warehouses, wool rooms, dye houses, etc., etc. The mill is worked by a water wheel 12 feet wide and 20 feet high, which is turned by two constant and powerful streams, by which they mean the Spadesbourne Brook and the Battlefield Brook. The machinery is of the best description, the steam engine of 12 horsepower on Watts principle. And so it goes on. But nobody wanted this mill, and it remained empty for many years later. Uh, in the 1830s, it was used as an isolation hospital for uh, when the cholera epide epidemic came upon us. And it remained until the 1880s when it was demolished by the new owners, the Sanders family. Now, here's a little glimpse of life at Perry Hall. This is the 1841 census. And right at the bottom, uh, again, those with eagle eyes should be able to read John Adams, age 71 now, in 1841, and he's a, um, well, he's a stamp distributor. That's how the Hausmans knew him. They told the story how Perry Hall was fortified uh, with all sorts of precautionary uh, shutters and uh, stout doorways to uh, discourage people coming in and stealing the stamps, which were sold to solicitors to put on legal documents. And Adams had connived somehow to become the distributor for this part of Worcestershire, which was perhaps a reasonable little income to top up his savings from when he was the worsted manufacturer. And can you see his wife, Keziah, is there, aged 55, and uh, he married her in 1835, she'd been the widow of the vicar of Halifax, no less, and, but she had a good nonconformist background, really, 
and so had he. They were uh, quite religious, but in a low church sort of way. You can see they have three servants, and that is the total complement of Perry Hall in 1841. So they were far too old to have children, and uh, so this is why the Hausman family, uh, his sister Jane had married a Hausman, that's why the Hausmans came to Bromsgrove. Adams died in 1858. That's just the date that the new cemetery opened in Bromsgrove, and his monument took pride of place just inside the gateway and remained uh, intact until about 20 years ago when the local authority thought it wise to knock it down as a danger to people walking by. It was only um, with the efforts of uh, Jenny and the Hausman Society that uh, the money was raised to repair it and so it looks much like this uh, today. Now, so 1858 is when John Adams uh, died and then a year later his wife Keziah dies and there's a delightful advert in the Worcester Journal and it talks about the household furniture at Perry Hall and it's got dining drawing room and chamber suites handsome mahogany telescope center Pembroke card and other tables handsome chiffoniers lounging and other chairs cabinet piano forte mahogany couches handsome chimney toilet and other glasses and so it goes on uh, and presumably this took several days to sell off all the furniture but what of Adam's brother-in-law his sister Jane married the Reverend Robert Hausman who came from Lancaster so far from having a Shropshire lad we could have had uh, a Lancashire lad a Leicestershire lad uh, or even uh, as we'll see later, a Gloucestershire lad. But uh, our poet's uh, great-grandfather, uh, Robert, was something of a celebrity in Lancaster. He founded St Anne's Church, probably because he didn't get on with the bishop and he found it uh, sensible to use the family money to build his own church and he had quite a following. Clerics who were good at doing sermons um, tended to attract groupies in the early 19th century. So he had a, a following of young ladies who thought he was rather good. And there was an occasion in the, um, about 1820, when his wife Jane appeared to be about to inherit a lot of money. And he wrote this rather, um, a risque letter to one of his followers, Miss Elizabeth Inman, in 1818. You'll be surprised to hear that Mrs. Hausman set off for London last Wednesday morning to attend the funeral next Monday of a very rich relation. She has no relation except a brother about 90 years old who wants for nothing nearer than Mrs. Hausman. But as maiden ladies who have attained more than three score years and ten sometimes act rather whimsically, she has bequeathed her large property, perhaps 100,000 or 150,000, to two single ladies. But whether old or young, we are not informed, probably rather ancient. If they should have no children, one half of her possessions, after some legacies, will become ours. Now, £100,000 in 1818 was millionaire territory. And this uh, wealthy lady who died lived in the Crescent in Bath. But the two single ladies whom she left a life interest in her property to were not ancient at all. They were relatively young. And they outlived the, the Reverend Robert Hausman by about 20 years. So he never saw this money. However, it sowed a seed in the Hausman family that they were about to inherit a lot of money. 
And of course, they started borrowing on the strength of it. And that's the seed of a lot of the Hausman problems. And um, OK, A. Hausman was probably a difficult child. And uh, one can excuse some of his eccentricity in that the family was still uh, living off uh, this inheritance, although it was much smaller than originally intended. Now, John Adams, as I say, took a great interest in his sister's children. And there were three boys, all born in Leicester, when the Reverend Robert was briefly a curate in Leicester. That's how he met her. And at least one of the three boys came to Bromsgrove School. So here we've got the early engraving of the main school building before they put a third story on it. And we know that at least one of the uh, Hausman boys, sons of the Reverend Robert of Lancaster, came to Bromsgrove School because there was a list of early pupils drawn up by the Reverend Price, who was master of the school from 1803 to 1810. So he drew up this list from memory and it's got on it all sorts of names that you should be uh, familiar with. But right at the bottom, he says, Hausman, etc., etc. And he doesn't say which Hausman it was. There were three boys, John, William, and Thomas. And I rather think John, the eldest, who's named after John Adams, of course, would have been the ideal choice to come to Bromsgrove School. And clearly, John Adams set him up in business in Bromsgrove because we have an extract here from the London Gazette, 1st of August, 1820, whereas a commission of bankruptcy is awarded against John Hausman, late of Bromsgrove in the county of Worcester, wool dealer. Now, presumably, John Adams had the means to steer him into a reasonable career, but John Hausman must have blued in all the money and uh, went bankrupt within a few years of being given the opportunity in Bromsgrove. And this wasn't all, because his brother William uh, also came to at least visit uh, Bromsgrove to see his uncle, and there met Mary Vernon, whose father was heir to Hanbury Hall, no less, so she was very eligible. And William Hausman was able to say, by the way, three months ago, uh, my uh, rich relation died, and she's going to leave us 100,000 pounds. <laughs> That is the only reason I can believe he managed to marry Mary Vernon, who was way, way above him socially. So the Vernons must have been hugely impressed with this promised inheritance. And indeed, in his bankruptcy hearings, because he went bankru bankrupt in 1821, three years after they married, they talk about a ship uh, being due to come in well, that's another fiction, I'm sure. This is all to do with the lady in Bath and the perceived inheritance. So here we are. We're in 1821, and the second brother has gone bankrupt. And he's, um, the bankruptcy is against William Hausman, late of Bridge Street, Blackfires, in the city of London, merchant. Now... William, How um, William Hausman certainly worked for John, Hausman, for, for John Adams in London in his capacity as a solicitor, but I don't think he was very good at it, and certainly he cut too many corners, as we will see from his subsequent bankruptcies later on. So these Hausmans uh, that John Adams had adopted turned out to be a mixed blessing and could bring discredit on the Adams household rather than credit. Now, William Hausman, uh, despite his bankruptcy, 
in 1827 bought this rather nice house in Gloucestershire, Woodchester House, with his wife's money. And they lived there happily for about 10 years until he got into railway shares and he went off to Salisbury to become the secretary and treasurer of a railway company. And he lived in this rather nice house in the close in Salisbury. But there he went bankrupt again. And as if that weren't enough, he left um, uh, Salisbury, briefly went back to Woodchester, and then he turns up in Brighton in 1851, where he goes bankrupt again. <laughs> this time he's embezzled a lot of his clients' money, including a chap who ran a school in Brighton, and uh, Hausman went off with his entire savings. So, the um, bankruptcy proceedings in Brighton have the note that Mr. Hausman has disappeared. And the Hausman family tradition was that he went to um, America with an actress. Now, he was in his mid-60s at this time, <laughs> And he had no money. I don't think he'd be very, very attractive to the average actress. So I think uh, he went somewhere where he could lie low. And we've got odd traces of a William Hausman a bit later, uh, 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 advising people on financial affairs, <laughs> stupid though they might be. Uh, but he never surfaced again, and we don't know where he's buried or exactly where he died. So here's a challenge for any family historians in the audience, Mike. Now, the third son was um, a model of good behavior. This is Thomas Hausman, uh, born in um, Leicester in 1795. And he uh, goes to Cambridge, uh, becomes a cleric, and his first posting is not far away from here, at Kinver. But Kinver uh, was um, not even a vicarage, it was a curacy, and the pay was lousy. So he stayed there for 15 years. So he can't have impressed the bishop much. And he left under a cloud in 1834. Uh, there must have been some internal strife in Kinver, and he was passed over for a promotion, and the local schoolmaster got the job of curate at Kinver. However, he lived in modest style in the high street in Kinver, and we've recently worked out where he lived, this interesting uh, little house on the high street. Now, he, in fact, uh, must have come to Bromsgrove as regularly as his... Uh, disgraced brothers, and he married a local girl, also a very eligible girl, and that was uh, Anne, the daughter of Joseph Brettel, the leading solicitor in Bromsgrove, and we're looking at his house uh, in St. John Street. So, uh, having married her in 1822, uh, they had quite a large family, and when uh, Joseph Brettel retired from a solicitor's practice. He uh, bought a house in uh, Catsill uh, and decided uh, to um, uh, live there. And he also uh, promoted, with John Adams, the new church at Catsill. And who should they choose as the first curate there but the Reverend Thomas Hausman? who'd lost his place at Kinver and hadn't yet found one. So, I don't know whether you call that nepotism or uh, luck, but here he is. He's the first incumbent of Catsill. And this is where he went to live with his father-in-law. So this, the clock house at Fockbury, became more or less well, like a vicarage for Catsill. And they lived there comfortably, and uh, jo Joseph Brettel died there, and his unmarried daughter stayed there with the Hausmans 
until the mid-1860s when the Reverend Thomas Hausman retired from here and he went off to this charming house which the Hausman Society visited a couple of years ago in Lyme Regis. And you see, each of these houses are rather grand and the actual income of the Reverend Thomas was extremely modest. So without the support of John Adams, Joseph Brettel, and the lady in Bath, they'd have been nowhere. And instead, they lived in some style, particularly in Lyme Regis. This is one of the most delightful houses there with a fabulous view over the town to the sea. And there, the Reverend Thomas Hausman, the, th the youngest and third uh, son of uh, Jane Adams uh, come Hausman, he died there in 1870. But they take his body back to um, Catsill, and here's the inscription on his monument there, Thomas Hausman, priest, to whom was uh, entrusted this church with this God's Acre, this parish, he deceased on the 24th day of January, 1870, aged 74 years. So a relatively blameless life compared with his brothers, certainly. But the, the Hausman malaise rubbed off on the Reverend Thomas's son, Edward, the father of the poet. He looks a bit of a rough diamond, doesn't he, in this photograph? And no doubt he, he was attractive to the ladies, but um, uh, rather uh, square-jawed and uh, not um, sort of um, social material, you would have thought. Anyway, he was certainly attractive to Jane Williams, daughter of the uh, rector of Woodchester in Gloucestershire. The Hausmans visited uh, Woodchester regularly uh, because the house there still belonged to um, uh, William Hausman, the disgraced lawyer who's disappeared, but his wife, uh, formerly a Vernon, still hung on to the ultimate ownership of the house at Woodchester. And the Hausmans visited there with the then tenants and later the owners of that gorgeous house. This is um, Edward Hausman's chosen bride, Sarah Jane Williams. She was a very cultured person. She wrote poetry, as did her father, and she was a very good mother. She um, uh, bore seven children, which rather wore her out. And she died in 1871 on A. Hausman, the poet's 12th birthday. He never forgave God for this, and he became uh, first a humanist and then an atheist. And uh, this having a, a grandfather and a great-grandfather who were Church of England ministers didn't um, affect him. He was uh, determined uh, not to believe in anything after his mother was taken away so cruelly. Now, the poet is born to Edward and Jane Hausman in 1859 at this house in Fockbury. It's called Valley House. And the Hausman family believed that they owned this house, but of course they didn't. Uh, it was rented from a local landowner, and they were only there a year until John Adams died and Perry Hall became vacant. So the young Edward and Jane uh, moved with their uh, infant child, Alfred Edward Hausman, to become the Shropshire lad. They moved from Valley House to Perry Hall. And here's another view of Perry Hall, still with the ivy on it. I don't think it looks at all right without the ivy on it. Do you? No, no, indeed. Anyway, there uh, the poet uh, grows up and he's there until his mother dies. And you can see from this later photograph of the garden and the house in the distance, 
what a paradise this was for a young family. So those seven children could be left to their own devices in this garden, and A. E. Hausman was their um, mentor and controller of their games and did much for their education before they ever went to school. This is the 1880s map of the garden. You can see uh, that huge um, glazed uh, affair to the um, southeast of the house. That was the vinery put there by Edward Hausman, who was ostensibly a solicitor in Bromsgrove, but a very poor one with very few clients. And he was also the uh, local um, inland revenue agent, and he wasn't much good at keeping accounts, so he got his daughter, Clements, to do the accounts for him, uh, even in her teens. And all he wanted to do was go fox hunting and uh, live the life of a country gentleman. But he led a rather strict religious regime at home, and certainly uh, A.E. Hausman and his brother Lawrence jibbed at this, particularly Lawrence, who didn't like uh, his social attitudes and uh, was determined as he grew up to develop very liberal uh, and pacifist views, which we'll uh, see later. But this is the environment in which the seven children grew up. Here is A. E. Hausman, uh, aged about six, with his younger brother Robert in the garden at Perry Hall. There's a particular description in Lawrence's um, autobiography where he talks about uh, A. E. Hausman um, explaining to them the solar system and they all had to um, revolve around him, so they adopted the identity of planets, and that's how he taught them astronomy. After the death of his mother in 1871, the family decided to move out of Perry Hall, presumably because of the associations with the mother, and because a new mother was being wheeled in. And here she is. She's called Lucy Agnes Hausman, and she's one of the daughters of the um, disgraced solicitor who's disappeared ostensibly to America, but we don't really know where he went. And she was living in London, and she's called upon to come and look after the young family, and she marries Edward Hausman uh, soon after. And indeed, uh, they rather warm to her. Um, Lawrence Hausman, who was a very precocious child, indeed uh, proposed to her at the age of 11 before her father did. <laughs> anyway, she did her best to look after the children. And certainly from the letters that A.E. Hausman wrote to her, he was very fond of her. So they go off to the uh, clock house instead of Perry Hall, and in 1875, uh, Edward Hausman's financial position is so uh, critical that uh, his mortgage on Perry Hall, which probably the family don't know anything about, is foreclosed upon by the man who lent the money. And so Perry Hall is uh, put on the market. At this time, uh, uh, A.E. Hausman is here at Bromsgrove School and imagine his fellow pupils saying, oh, I believe your house is up for sale. And uh, how do you account for that? And he'd be a young, sensitive soul, probably bullied dreadfully, but he was a favourite of the headmaster, Millington, and presumably he was afforded some protection in that way. But if you read his brother Lawrence's autobiography, then Lawrence was definitely badly bullied and got no protection whatever, and he disliked Millington greatly. So the two of them had slightly different experiences of coming to Bromsgrove School. However, here's the advert for 
their father's house in 1875, a commodious residence standing in its own grounds of about two acres, containing dining and drawing rooms, each 22 feet by 16 feet and 12 feet high, library, schoolroom, 25 feet by 12 feet, and so it goes on. And it says, the premises also comprise a vinery, 90 feet by 18 feet, vines in full bearing. Edward Hausman even got a patent for heating greenhouses. That's where his interest lay. And he paid little attention to paying the interest on his mortgage, which is why this sale took place. Eventually, his younger brother, who was a cleric in the West Country, came to the rescue and bought Perry Hall and persuaded them to sell the clock house so that some uh, thing came out of the ruins and the family moved back to Perry Hall. It's a much complica more complicated affair than I've just outlined, but I won't bore you with the details. So they're back at Perry Hall by 1880. By this time, uh, A. Hausman is ready to go off to Oxford. And his father remains at Perry Hall for the rest of his life. Now this is a clipped bit of a family photograph. And Edward Hausman looks a bit unkempt. And other versions of this photograph have been doctored to tidy up his hair and perhaps cut his beard a little so that he doesn't look quite so aggressive. But this is a man who liked his drink and was quite amusing company to his friends. Jo, if she was here, would back me up on this. She uh, was recently uh, the bailiff of the court leet and she described at a Hausman do how Edward Hausman was invited to court leet dinners to give the toast to the bishop and the diocese. And his uh, responses were highly amusing and rather critical of clerics in general. And he was able to excuse this by saying his father and his grandfather were clerics, so he should know. But if you read the newspaper accounts of his speeches at these uh, courtly dinners, they're incredibly rambling and disjointed and he'd obviously had far too much to drink, certainly by the end of the speech. And you can't imagine why they invited him back every year to give them. They must have thought he was a rather amusing turn and to be tolerated. Anyway, he lived out his days at Perry Hall until 1894 at the generosity of his son, the cleric in the Southwest. And only after he died uh, did his widow move out and Perry Hall was again genuinely on the market. Here is his gravestone in Cats Hill Churchyard. And it says Edward Hausman and it gives his dates that he died in 1894, aged, is it 83 or is it 63? Uh, I can't read it on my screen here. Perhaps you can read it off the big screen. Anyway, here is the advert for Perry Hall in 1895. The home contains handsome entrance hall, dining and drawing, breakfast and smoking rooms, seven bedrooms and dressing rooms with capital kitchen and other domestic offices. The outbuildings comprise coachman's cottage stabling, coach house, groom's room, harness room, etc. And it mentions the gardens with, uh, planted with uh, shrubs and trees and a conservatory and vinery forming one range is well built and supplied with heating apparatus, uh, patent heating apparatus, I might add. So, 1795, is really when the Hausmans depart from Bromsgrove. And Edward's widow, now looking rather um, fearsome in her older age, she retires to Malvern, 
in a much smaller house and dies in 1907. But the family visit her there regularly and A. E. Hausman wrote to her very regularly and very indiscreetly actually about his personal life. You don't really uh, tell your stepmother that you're going out with a, um, a boatman in Venice, do you? But he did. So, here, here is the young Alfred Edward Hausman, aged 18, going off to Oxford uh, to make his way in the world. Uh, remember, he'd been more or less the head boy at Bromsgrove School, certainly the apple of the headmaster's eye, and at Oxford, he also starred, winning all the poetry and classics prizes, at least in the first year or two. But very soon, he meets Moses Jackson. Jackson is a scientist, uh, seems to waltz through his course, and in the evenings, uh, he and Hausman have long conversations into the early hours when Hausman should be writing his essays. He's hanging on every word of Moses Jackson. And Moses Jackson appears to be thoroughly heterosexual, but uh, Alfred Edward Hausman is obsessed with him. So much so that when Jackson leaves with a first class honours degree, he becomes something important in the patent office in London. And uh, Hausman, on the other hand, fails his final exams for a variety of reasons, probably because he's too clever it seems, to answer paltry questions set by his tutors. And he flunks the final exams, and he ends up uh, as a clerk in the patent office, uh, much junior to his friend Jackson. But they share a house, well, a flat together, with Jackson's brother in Bayswater. So for the next few years, Hausman is idyllically happy living with his friend. However, in 1885, something happens. Um, uh, Lawrence Hausman speculates that uh, Alfred um, uh, declared his love for Jackson. Jackson was horrified and Hausman disappeared for a week. Nobody knows where he went. They applied to his father in Bromsgrove to see if he'd gone home. He hadn't. And so this is a blank week in Hausman's life. But something dramatic had certainly happened. And he goes off uh, on his own uh, to live in a flat. And uh, he sees Jackson infrequently after that. And during this time, as a clerk at the patent office, every evening he goes to the British Museum and carries on his classic studies. So much so that he writes uh, learned articles in all the classical journals and makes a name for himself as a classical scholar. So much so that in 1892, he applies for the professorship of Latin at London University. And in his application, he says, if I am unsuccessful, I would like to also apply for the professorship of Greek. And, but they actually appointed him. Good for them. Uh, they weren't pompous. They saw that this man had a great um, love of learning and a following in the classical world. And they took a punt on a young uh, star of the classics world. It would never happen today. So, A. Hausman, having lost his friend who's now got married and has disappeared to India to be the head of a technical institute there, uh, without telling Hausman that A. he was getting married and B. he was going to India, um, such shocks um, just uh, made life seem even worse for Hausman. But in 1893, uh, as the new professor of classics, he returns to Bromsgrove 
for the opening of Littleton House. That's the one on the uh, right. Is it? Yes, it is on the right. So he's the star guest at the opening of this new building at Bromsgrove School. And at this time, he's living in Highgate in this delightful house called Byron Cottage. What an apt name for a budding poet. And uh, that house, you can see there's a plaque on it. Uh, it tells you to this day, this was where A Shropshire Lad was written in 1895 to 96. Here is the title page. Now we're not quite sure what sparked this burst of creative activity by A. E. Hausman. Was it um, a, perhaps, a letter returned from his friend in India? Uh, was it just a reawakening of his attachment to this young man? But if you read A Shropshire Lad, you'll find there's lots of lads and very few lasses. And indeed, se several of the poems are autobiographical. And you can see the uh, influence of Jackson behind the whole production. And I'm singling out one poem which I left up on the screen earlier on. This is my favourite Hausman poem, and it contains some fantastic lines in two short verses. Into my heart an air that kills from yon far country blows. What are those blue remembered hills? What spires, what farms are those? That is the land of lost content. I see its shining plain, the happy highways where I went and cannot come again. And there you have the immortal phrase, blue remembered hills. And indeed, if you look from here to um, Mulvern, they are blue, those hills. I don't think they're Shropshire Hills, they're Worcestershire Hills. And the land of lost content is wherever his friend Jackson isn't anymore. And the happy highways where I went are ones he can't go with Jackson anymore. Things look up for Hausman, however. The book of poetry is remarkably well received and he becomes a notable figure in the literary world. And his influence in classics is also growing, such that in 1911, when the professorship of Latin at Cambridge comes up, he applies and gets the job. This is a chap who failed his finals at Oxford. Isn't this amazing? I wish I'd been that lucky. I have a very checkered academic career. Anyway, so he's a store installed in Cambridge in 1911. Another occasion in which he bursts into poetry is probably influenced by his friend Jackson, who's now moved to Canada to be a farmer and is ailing and expected soon to die in 1922. And Hausman gathers together uh, poems that he didn't feel brave enough to put into a Shropshire lad, and also some new poems, and produces last poems in time to send the new volume to Jackson in Canada before the, the uh, beloved friend dies. And there's a touching letter in which he uh, accompanies the volume and says to Jackson, uh, if he could, he'd have followed him around the world and blacked his boots. And Jackson's highly embarrassed and writes back, what nonsense. And, uh, but he does admit to the fact that he's kept uh, his edition of Shropshire Lad, and clearly he kept um, a lot of uh, letters, and he also kept the newspaper cuttings for the publication of Last Poems, which on the strength of a Shropshire lad was sold out almost instantly and went through several reprints in the same year of publication, 
Well, poetry doesn't normally sell like this. This is remarkable. And the author of A Shropshire Lad, people have been waiting for 20 years for the sequel, and now they've got it. This is my favourite poem from Last Poems, 1922. And of course, it's all about Jackson. When I would muse in boyhood, the wild green woods among, and nurse resolves and fancies because the world was young. It was not foes to conquer, nor sweethearts to be kind, but it was friends to die for that I would seek and find. I sought them far and found them, the sure, the straight, the brave, the hearts I lost my own to, the souls I could not save. They braced their belts about them, they crossed in ships the sea, they sought and found six feet of ground, and there they died for me. I think that phrase, they sought and found six feet of ground, is why Hausmann is somewhat regarded as a war poet, although that wasn't his intention. This is all about Jackson. And what of uh, A. E. Hausmann's uh, family? His uh, next in line brother, Robert Holden Hausman. Uh, he became an electronics engineer in Birmingham and he died young in 1905. He'd gone to visit his sister uh, near Bath and he waded into a river to take a particularly good photograph and caught pneumonia and never recovered. So he never married, so no children via him. The next in line is Clemens Hausman, the one who did all the accounts for her useless father. And she was uh, very artistic. Uh, she wrote novels, in, including one called The Werewolf, which is now incredibly valuable and sought after. And she became the companion and mentor of her younger brother, uh, Lawrence, and she was sent off to London with him when he went to art school in London as a safe pair of hands. And they remained together all their lives. And we'll see what happened to her brother Lawrence in a moment. So she never married. She was um, a stalwart um, suffragette and went to prison for not paying her tax on a holiday home in, on the south coast and this was uh, her way of protesting um, uh, no taxation unless I get the vote. The next in line was uh, their sister Catherine. Now she did get married, she married a, sc a schoolmaster from Bromsgrove School in 1887 and he eventually moved to Huddersfield, to another school, and then became the headmaster of King Edward's School, Bath. So she moved with him to Bath. And the family decided they liked Bath, and they had a, a joint uh, memorial placed in the cemetery there that they were all supposed to be either buried in or commemorated on. So if you go to the cemetery now, there's a big Hausman memorial. That's part of your Hausman pilgrimage if you do the full uh, course. By the way, I should say that she became the family historian. And it's her um, analysis of the family background which was accepted by all her brothers and sisters and which omits the early history of um, John Adams and uh, also uh, gets various things wrong uh, which I won't dwell upon but in 1935 it was very difficult to do family history whereas now uh, we've got immense resources on the internet uh, that supplement our, um, uh, our records in record offices. So she did her best and she's the one that uh, found the letter about the inheritance in 1818 and uh, she writes to her brothers and sisters, what an amazing find I've got. Wasn't our 
great-grandfather indiscreet. The next in line was Basil Hausman. Now, he went off, he became a doctor. Uh, he was a doctor at a hospital in Taunton in Somerset. Then he moved to Stockport, so he was also a long way away from Bromsgrove. But he married uh, the daughter of Matthew Dixon, the wealthy coal merchant from Tardybig. And eventually they returned to this area because he became the medical inspector of schools in Worcestershire. And they went to live with her father at Lower House in Tardybig. And they remained there for the rest of their days. Uh, the father-in-law uh, died and left them the house, so they lived. The housemen seemed to bounce back very well and live in very pleasant houses. And the youngest of them, no, not quite the youngest, this is Lawrence, but uh, one of our um, audience tonight remarked upon uh, him being the most interesting of the Hausman children. Well, we'll forgive her that, uh, given we're celebrating A.E. Hausman, but the society also promotes interest in all of the Hausmans, so Lawrence is a legitimate uh, case study. Now, he uh, goes to art school in Bromsgrove briefly before he goes off to London with his sister to art college there in Kensington. And they're both there. She becomes a uh, woodcut artist, an illustrator, and he becomes an illustrator too, but he's also writing poetry, novels, plays, and becomes the drama critic for the Manchester Guardian, a job which produced a reasonable income compared with his um, writings, which were not as well received of those of his brother. But he was well known in London, and uh, he was in all the best society, close friend of Oscar Wilde, and when Oscar Wilde had to flee the country, uh, his friends sent uh, Hausman to Paris with gifts, money, and encouragement. So he was very much um, in the avant-garde in London in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. He too was a great uh, advocate of women's suffrage and joined his um, sister on their marches and he became one of the most popular speakers about women's suffrage and about pacifism and he traveled all over the world giving talks on pacifism. Here is where he started his artistic career at the Art College, which was briefly in the former Crown Inn. Uh, when this photograph was taken, it's the Bromsgrove Messenger Office. But that's where the original art school was. In London, he and his sister took on this very nice cottage in Kensington, uh, which had belonged to an artist before. And in the garden was a studio where uh, Clements made all the banners for the suffrage marches. And here they are in front of one such banner. And you see what a dapper figure uh, Lawrence Hausman is. And uh, <laughs> uh, Clements looks rather butch, does she not? Uh, but apparently this uh, costume was modeled on something she saw in a suffrage magazine and so this was what um, the committed were wearing at the time. You see the lady behind her is in more normal uh, Edwardian garb. And eventually the two of them leave London and they go to live in Street in Somerset near their friends the Clarks of shoe uh, fame and they build this house called Longmeadow where they live for the rest of their life. And Lawrence has a uh, shed in the garden, which he calls his elbow room, and that's where all his writings are done. And there's one particular thing that he wrote, um, uh, Victoria Regina, 
which was something uh, like The Crown is today. It was immensely popular as a play and very risque because in the 1930s you weren't supposed to uh, depict the royal family in any drama. But Edward VIII, in his brief reign, relaxed these rules and uh, Lawrence Hausman's production of Victoria Regina was a smash hit. He became something like Lord Webber in the, uh, in the West End and uh, Victoria Regina transferred to Broadway. Suddenly, Lawrence Hausman was wealthy. He had a chauffeur, a yellow Daimler, and he used to drive his brother around England on holiday. Well, he didn't drive, the chauffeur drove, but they must have uh, looked a, a right pair um, uh, going to visit all their chums in the literary and dramatic world, uh, including a visit to Broadway to uh, meet the uh, famous um, American actress Mary Anderson who lived there and the Hausman Society are going to her house where her grandson still lives and we're going to reenact this visit this coming July. And finally we've got the youngest of the family George Herbert Hausman who died in the Boer War in 1901 and again some of the poetry, uh, there's, I think in last poems, the word death is the most common word uh, beyond the. And uh, we read it um, as a group in Bromsgrove School um, on one occasion, the Hausman Society. And we all sat in a circle and read um, a couple of poems each. And uh, it was very morbid to see them all uh, read at one stage, but uh, certainly the death of his brother did influence him, and there's lots of references in Hausmann's poetry to soldiers and to bereavement. And so, Hausmann himself lived out his days in Cambridge. Here he is aged 70, and here's the room in Cambridge that he was moved to uh, shortly before he died, a ground floor room instead of the one he used to have two floors up. And he used to joke that he ran up these stairs in the hope that he would drop dead at the top. <laughs> and instead they moved him into this more cautious room uh, on the quad in Trinity College. And it's here that after his death, Lawrence Hausman went to sort out his papers. And there Above the uh, mantel shelf was the picture of Moses Jackson. And there were many poems that Hausmann hadn't felt able to put in his published works. But Lawrence, uh, being far more gregarious, decided that a lot of them would make a very uh, jolly further volume. So here it is, more poems, published months after the poet's death, uh, edited by his brother, with some poems which are rather indiscreet. And this is my favorite, and you can see why um, A. E. Hausman might not have put this in the previous volumes. Because I liked you better than suits a man to say, it irked you, and I promised to throw the thought away. To put the world between us, we parted stiff and dry. Goodbye, said you, forget me. I will no fear, said I. If here where clover whitens, the dead man's knoll you pass, and no tall flower to meet you starts in the trefoil grass, halt by the headstone naming the heart no longer stirred, and say the lad that loved you was one that kept his word. There we are. Thank you.
Here comes my co-author of the Bromsgrove book, Jenny. Are you going to use the microphone? Yes, I will. Yes. Right. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening to such a fascinating talk. We've learned so many things. We've learned so many things about Hausmann that we certainly never knew before. Um, I would also like to thank Bromsgrove School for letting us use their lovely facilities here, and to Liz Swift and Tom Jude um, from the Bromsgrove School events team for helping us organise this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank. Julian for his fascinating talk and I'd like to hand over now. Thank you very much indeed. My name is Peter Wayne. I'm chairman of the Houseman Society and I do most sincerely want to thank first of all the, the Bromsgo Society for allowing us to have this event this evening. It's always lovely to liaise with them, with a the fellow society and also of course to thank Julian. It's not the first time that Julian has been to this school. He came, he confessed before his talk this evening to me, he came at the age of 10 to sit the entry exam, and he failed it. <laughs> so I think either I should reconsider his position as editor of the journal, or else the exam didn't really test some of the skills that make somebody successful and succinct and very really entertaining, as uh, Julian has certainly been uh, this evening. And what I find interesting is with Hausmann, I know he's not F-Boy's cup of tea, but those people who like his poetry regard it as almost the best poetry that's ever been, ever been composed, ever been written. And as Julian emphasised, his work has never been uh, out of favour, has never been out of print. And there's a paucity of the, of, the, of the poetry. There's not a great deal that's been written, but it was certainly more than rumoured that even though he only published uh, Shropshire Lad at that stage, that he was offered the poet laureateship. And the other night I was having dinner with somebody who said I'm the great-grandson of John Maysfield, of course a great poet laureate, but I said well actually not many of his poems seem to uh, be uh, very often published, they always seem the same three or four, all of which are wonderful, and he said oh no there are many many uh, ones just as good as that. Uh, get the complete works. So I, I ordered the complete works the next day, huge volume, about 800 pages, and I found perhaps one more uh, as good as the three or four that many of us will know. So I felt that, you know, really, Hausmann hit the target more frequently than uh, many other poets, even though he didn't write that much. And I think the illustrations that we had this evening give a very good feel as to what um, that really means to many people that can register and, and he, can, he can talk to us about. And I will just say we have another event coming up in this very fine theatre on the 10th of July, and although um, uh, Julian failed that entry exam, if he, if he pays the price of uh, £25 which includes a drink and the students are free, or £12 for the live stream link, you can, part, you can actually come to this concert or, or enjoy the concert um, on at the 10th of July at 7pm. The details are out at the reception desk and it features the Dante Quartet uh, amongst others. But it also um, is one, one or two examples, Ray Vaughan Williams, for example, putting his poetry to music. Um, Hausmann never liked it or claimed he never liked anybody's composition, even Butterworth. Uh, most people would disagree with Hausmann on that. Um, but it should be a wonderful evening, so if you are interested, there are the details, and it is the 10th of July. But once again, thank you, Society, very much indeed, Bromsgo Society, and thank you in particular, Julian. Many thanks. Thank you.